Good morning, AGF and others joining us this morning. We're here to worship God, and we're so glad that uh, you've joined in. And I'm so glad that our worship team is ready to lead us into the very presence of God. And to Kelly Gurley, our worship pastor, Kelly, I want to express a deep appreciation to you and to all your team. And I want to say thank you so much for uh, leading us into the presence of God. I can't believe it. This is week number eight since we've been um, away, but uh, we're trusting that uh, God will bring us together again real, real soon. This being the first Sunday of May, it is Mission Sunday, and I'm uh, delighted to tell you that in just a while, you're going to be hearing from one of our very own uh, Pueblo-born missionaries. And uh, Forrest Rowell is our U.S. missionary to the American teenager, and he's had great influence, uh, not only within our community, but within our district and really within our nation. And also, I want you to know that you're going to get to see and hear from our youth pastor, Will Lurch, as well. So it's going to be a great day, and let's worship God with everything that's within us.
Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. ourselves your children and we know that through your blood you didn't just save us to leave us God you are the way maker when there seems to be no way you always make a way for us
I worship you. I worship you. Oh! 
Good morning, AGF. Pastor Will here. It's just an amazing morning to be hanging out with you guys. Just know I'm missing you guys a ton. I'm missing on Sunday mornings, praising with you guys. I'm missing you guys a ton, but you guys are definitely in my prayers, okay? But we got a man here this morning. And so what I'd like to introduce is my man. <laughs> one of my main <laughs> mentors in my life, a guy who's kind of coached me through just the rounds of life, you know, just taught me a lot. Pastor Forrest Rowell is here with us, Youth Alive Missionary. Pastor Forrest, I just got a few quick questions for you, man, just so that way the people can kind of understand more about you, more about what you stand for and the things you kind of stand for as a human being and also as a missionary, okay? Amen. So what is Youth Alive? Well, let me, let me answer that. But before I do, can I simply say hi as well uh, on behalf of my family who's not able to be with you today? Uh, let me say hello to you. And we love your pastors. Your pastors are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, pastors Mark and Jeanette, uh, Pastors Rob and Kelly, uh, Pastor Ron and Mary McFeeders, as well as Pastor Will Lurch. We are stoked. Youth Alive is really simple. And uh, Will, you've been around the block with Youth Alive for quite some time. Simply put, we're missionaries to the American teenager. And we want to reach the American teenager by connecting the church to middle school and high school campuses within your communities. You serve as a U.S. missionary. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that entails? Absolutely. We are honored, privileged, and super stoked to be U.S. missionaries through the Assemblies of God. What does that mean? Well, there's quite a few faces in the field. As a matter of fact, there are 1,020 U.S. missionaries that exist today. 684, uh, 681 actively endorsed chaplains, as well as 204 missionary associates, which we are blessed to have James and Tammy Marty as a part of our team. They've been a tremendous uh, addition to our squad and what God has been able to do in and through Youth Alive within the Rocky Mountain Ministry Network. This all in, is, is plays a picture uh, within the seven windows of U.S. missions of the Assemblies of God. Let me quickly run through those seven windows. One, chaplaincy ministry. Two, Chi Alpha, which is a college ministry. Three, intercultural ministry. Four, missionary church planners and developers. Five, teen challenge. Six, U.S. maps workers, and seven, youth alive. I try to explain that very briefly. Why? Because we play a, a piece to the puzzle in this great uh, mosaic of trying to reach the American culture, the American population for the cause of Christ. Youth Alive is significant because 98% of our population today will make its way through one of our 67,000 middle school or high school campuses. And now I say all that, and it's so funny because now the whole world has shifted. So those statistics might have been true and accurate maybe, um, I don't know, three, four months ago. Uh, the whole world is kind of upside down as we know it. But one thing's for sure. We are excited to reach the, the American teenager for the cause of Christ. Uh, just a quick testimony to like the stuff I've seen with you, man. I've had the amazing privilege and honor to travel with you and also James Marty, an amazing guy, an amazing man of God just all the way around. I love his family. I love hanging out with his daughters and his wife. They're amazing people. Uh, but just, man, this is an amazing ministry you guys have had, have had going and are just exploding with where you guys are heading. What's one exciting story you can share with us this morning? Yeah. Well, let me say this too. Thank you, Will. We appreciate this guy. This guy's a tremendous part of our team and helps us do amazing things uh, to reach students for Christ. And ultimately, that's our goal. Our goal is to help students, middle school, high school students primarily, know who Jesus is and accept Him as their Lord and Savior. Youth Alive missionaries encourage, equip, and empower students to reach students. You know what we call that? We call that campus missionaries. It's a middle school or a high school student who's excited about what God is doing on the inside and they want to let it show on the outside. That is a campus missionary. And we want to do our very best to help them reach students and their friends for Jesus. It was just recently, a couple of months ago, that we were in a place called Montrose. Everybody say Montrose. That's right. Montrose, Colorado. We were there uh, with um, Pastor Chris Peterson 
His, his son is the youth pastor, Pastor Tyler, and we got to do a training with their students. And that training was all wrapped around this, the Alive in Five uh, resource. We were able to encourage students, right, equip students, and then empower them to make a difference in the world around them. There was one young man by the name of Noah. He's a seventh grader at uh, Centennial Middle School in Montrose. And he was able to go to his school campus and take some of the things that he learned, applied it to his life. And he was engaging with some of the other students on the campus. And one of his very best friends came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So we are so excited about what God is doing in and through students. I want to thank you as a church for being a part of our journey, the significant part, if you will. You guys pray for us and you sow seed into our ministry, and you help us do things like we just discussed. And that's to help students reach students. And uh, so, man, we are excited about what God is doing. Thank you for being a part of our journey, and we are eager. And can I also share this, Pastor Will? We were able to engage and give this resource because of generous people just like you. We were able to engage and resource students and leaders Nearly 1,500 students and leaders with tools just like this over the past year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Forrest. I appreciate that. Just a quick interview. Uh, AGF, I just want to thank you guys for allowing us into your homes and allowing us to have a word for you this morning. Pastor Forrest, we're going to leave it over to you. AGF, from me to you, have a great morning. Enjoy this. Hope. 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 It's something that we all need. But unfortunately, we all don't experience. We can sometimes find ourselves consumed by the problems that life throws at us. Many of us feel overwhelmed. Fearful. Doubtful. Anxious and full of anxiety. But we don't have to. Because Jesus is our one and only hope. He's the one to turn to in times of trouble. Doubt and uncertainty. Jesus will never let us down. It's time to stop putting our faith in worldly things. And start trusting Jesus, our living hope. So during this time of global panic, fear, and worry, we encourage you to say yes to life. Focus on the future. Make a difference. And win some small victories. Because hope is a difference maker. We can choose hope today. Change our way of thinking. And in the end, <laughs> hope will pay off. I have hope. 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 Today I would like to share this simple message with you entitled Lessons from Anna's Life. In Luke chapter 2, verse 36 through 38, we see a short passage of scripture, three verses to be exact, about a woman named Anna. Let's read in verse 36. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phineul from the tribe of Asher. And she was very old. Her husband died when they were only married for seven years. Then she lived as a widow at the age of 84. She never left the temple. She stayed there night and day, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about this child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Today, I really feel like this short, simple message is going to hit home with many who are hearing this today. It's very simple, very practical for you and for me to pick up some lessons from Anna's life. If we set the table real quick, you've got to understand some of the context in Luke chapter 2. This goes from a wide uh, span of time. 
Luke, at the beginning of chapter 2, we're talking about Jesus being born. We're talking at the end of Luke chapter 2, walking into chapter 3, where He's being baptized by John the Baptist. You see this amazing uh, text in Luke chapter 2 that can cover some major ground. But in this particular passage, we see that Anna is in the temple. And she's there when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus for baby dedication. And so Jesus is there, and He's there to be dedicated before the Lord with the prophet Simeon. And Anna, this prophetess, she sees this all taking place. Let's talk a little bit about Anna and her life and where she comes from. A couple of things that you'll want to know about Anna. The first is this. Anna was a prophetess. A prophetess is simply one who speaks the word. You see, in this particular passage, it's really unique. Because as we look at this, we understand that, man, she was there before Jesus came to be in human form. And there she is as the Old Testament prophet, if you will. And she's now walking into this new era of seeing Jesus and watching this all unfold in the New Testament would make her one of the first New Testament missionaries. It's a powerful uh, passage of Scripture. In Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 38, it also points out that her father's name was Phanuel. Phanuel is a unique name that simply says this, it's the place where Jacob wrestled with God. And the actual meaning of Phinuel is I've seen God face to face. How powerful is that imagery for you and for me when we see this woman of God standing in this temple as Jesus is carried in by Mary and Joseph there for dedication and she simply has the privilege of looking into his eyes. You know what she's doing? She's seeing Jesus. She's seeing God face to face. That's so cool to me. The third thing I would encourage us to know about Anna is this, that she comes from the tribe of Asher. This tribe They're no good. They're backsliders. They're losers, if you will. They don't have a good reputation. As a matter of fact, you don't hear of the tribe of Asher again until the book of Revelation. They were this wishy-washy people that went up and down in their relationship with God. Not a lot of consistency came from the tribe of Asher. But in verse 37, it says, But Anna served God. You see, she made a conscious decision, a choice to serve God Almighty. I think that's so cool and I think it's so powerful for you and for me to learn some lessons from Anna's life today. So a couple of things you needed to know about her. We've talked about that. She's a prophetess, her father's name, and the tribe that she comes from. Now let's talk about a couple of words that would describe her. Real simply is this. She was a wife. She was a widow. She was a worshiper. She was a witness. She was a woman of God and she was a watchful witness waiting for Jesus to arrive. Waiting to see that prophecy fulfilled. And sure enough, she had that moment. That special moment in her time and in her life. So what are a couple of lessons that we might want to learn from her life? Let me point out the first lesson is this. She was old, but not dead. Come on, somebody. I know you might be sitting there right now, and you might be thinking to yourself, I'm old and I'm almost dead. Listen, she was old, but she was not dead. I've been around a lot of people in my life, and sometimes you get around some quote, older people, and you know what? They act dead. There's no life in them. There's no enthusiasm. There's no passion. It's all gone. Now listen, i got to tell you that in Anna's life, she was old, but she wasn't dead. That's significant for you and for me 
to understand. My grandfather, who I respectfully refer to as Big G, Big G was a hero in my life. Big G was legendary and is legendary. He'll continue to live on, even though he's passed uh, many, many years ago. He'll continue to be a legend in my life, and he continues to teach me lessons every single day. You know what he taught me? <laughs> he, he taught me this with his own life's example. He was old, but he wasn't dead. You see, grand, granddaddy, my grandpa, my big G, he was the one that taught me how to play checkers. He was the one that taught me how to throw a frisbee. He was the one that taught me how to jump off the roof into a pool. He was awesome. He was wild. He was crazy. He was up there in years, but he was far from dead. His greatest passion in his life, though, that he taught, uh, taught me as a younger generation was to serve Jesus. Serve Jesus with all of your heart. We need to know this. We are old, but not dead. And can I tell you, can I just get real? I know I'm a missionary to the American teenager, but I'm an old man. I got a lot of gray up in this beard. I'm old, all right? but I still have a passion to connect the things of God to this young generation. Anna, in her life, did the same. Second thing I'll point out is this. Anna's life successfully taught the younger generation about commitment. Everybody say commitment. It's important that you and I, as elders in the church today, we show what it is to be committed to the things of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6 verse 9, in the New Living Translation, it says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Fully committed to Him. This was Anna. She showed commitment in her life. This was an incredible opportunity for her to teach the younger generations about what it is to be committed to God, even though everything kind of goes squirrely. She was thrown a couple of curveballs in her life. You see, she was only married for seven years. And then she became a widow. Her husband died. It doesn't say how. It doesn't give us too much uh, information there to work with. But we know this, that her life was not perfect. She experienced some pain. She experienced some, some frustration. She experienced levels of stress. Some things that you and I, we know all too well. And sometimes we get discouraged and we lose a thing called commitment. May we return just like Anna and be committed to the things of God. This is something that we can learn from Anna's life and something that we can teach to the younger generation. Another lesson that Anna's life successfully taught to this younger generation was the lesson of dedication. Dedication is powerful. Listen, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. It's important for you and for me to understand this, that every day when we wake up, we have the ability to teach this younger generation what it is to not only be committed, but to be dedicated to the things of God. It's so important for you and for me as elders in the church today to stand up and show our commitment for the things of God, to be dedicated to the things of God, and to number three, be consistent in the things of God. Listen, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 6, it talks about this. It says there is much more that we could say about this, but... Uh, we, we can go on in verse 12 and it says this, you've been believers for a long time. You ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need somebody to teach you basic things about God's Word. 
Babies need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who's lived on milk is still an infant. Doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature. Who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So let us go on from the basic teachings. Let us go on and let us mature in the things of God. Let us become consistent in our growth. Consistent in our walk with God. Consistently seeking His direction for our life. Listen, it's not just simply about you and you succeeding in your level of commitment, your level of dedication, your level of consistency. But this teaches this younger generation, the American teenager, what it is to fall in love with Christ. And the truth is that Jesus really does make a difference. A fourth thing that I would point out that this lesson from Anna's life that she was able to successfully teach to this younger generation was this. She was faithful. Everybody say faithful. She had a level of faithfulness about her. And in, when I think of faithfulness, I think of Galatians chapter 5. Verse 20 through 22 through 23, it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. She faithfully lived her life in such a way that she continued to grow fruit on a daily basis. You see it says. Many times. That they shall know you by your. Fruits. They shall know you. They shall know you by your fruits. About your love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. And self control. We as Christians. As elders in our church today. We must faithfully. Continue to grow fruit in our life. So that we can show this world all that's wrapped all around us. That Jesus really does matter. That Jesus really does make a difference. Another aspect or characteristic that she taught to the younger generation was this. What it is to be steadfast. Steadfast. In Psalm 108 verses 1 through 3 it says this. I, oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. My heart is steadfast. I will give praise even with my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken at the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. And I will sing praises to you. Among the generations. She was steadfast. She taught that lesson. In her life to this younger generation. You know what that means? She was steadfast. She was immovable. In her relationship with God. Even though life was throwing some curveballs. Her direction. Even though it didn't seemingly. Go the way that she had anticipated. Or projected for her future to go. But God showed up and said, you just give it to me. I'll walk with you. I'll remind you of what it is with the, that I can do in your life. You simply be immovable and steadfast in your relationship with me. Another aspect of her life, and the last one that we'll talk about here today is this, that she was a witness. In Luke chapter 2, verse 38 In our text today, it says that she came along just as Simeon was being handed Jesus to be dedicated unto the Lord, was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about this child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. She was an ultimate witness She was an ultimate witness that said, you know what, I cannot wait. I've got to tell people. I've got to prepare people because Jesus is coming. And she did a phenomenal job at that. You and I in this place today, 
We need to be incredible witnesses just like Anna. These are all amazing attributes of our God, our Creator. Listen, will you please direct your attention back to God's Word? And can I tell you this, that man, this characteristic, this attribute of commitment, dedication, consistency, faithfulness, steadfastness, being a witness, these are all characteristics of our God and our Creator. Anna was simply a good reflection of her God. She became a good reflection because she studied, applied, and shared the Word of God with the world around her. It's a call in our text today for you and for me to be Anna's. To be Anna's to this younger generation. Let me close with this story. I told you my big G was my hero for many reasons. But ultimately he was my hero because he served Jesus with great passion. And he taught me what that looked like when I was about eight years old. I got into a plane right out of here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Not far from where I was born and raised in Pueblo, Colorado. And I got onto a plane and I got to fly to Phoenix, Arizona as an eight-year-old kid to spend two weeks with who? None other than Big G. Grandma was there too, no doubt. and Grandma was great. But Big G was like on a whole other planet. And I got to be in his hip pocket for two weeks as a little boy. And he taught me a lot of cool things to do, a lot of fun ways to live life. But one thing that I'll never forget is this. That he took me to an orange grove on the back of his Honda dirt bike. And we rode out in this orange grove and he put a gunny sack in my hands and he propped me up in the tree and I pulled some oranges and filled the sack and put it on my back and we got back onto his motorcycle and headed back to what I thought was going to be home. But we didn't go home. I thought we were going to go have a vitamin C feast. But it turned out to be something quite different. Matter of fact, those oranges didn't go into my mouth. But he drove up his dirt bike up under these underpasses and we put the bike down and he would grab me by the hand as an eight-year-old little boy and he put an orange in my other hand and he would say, walk this over to that homeless man and tell him that Jesus loves him. And I did that. And it was so fun to see this relationship that he had with Jesus lived out on a regular basis. I could tell you story after story that he taught me as an older man, as a grandfather in my life, that he taught me as a little boy about how to live my life for Jesus. We are called to be just like Anna we're called to be just like my big G. We're called to be examples of what it is to serve Jesus Christ in real life and in real time. So let me conclude with this final passage of Scripture in Psalm 71, 18. It says, Though I'm old and I'm gray, I still have a passion to connect the things of God to this young generation. I'm old, I'm gray, yet I still have a passion to connect the things of God to this younger generation. May that be your heart, may that be your cry today. May we be who God has called us to be. As I wrestled with this final question is this, what's the best way that we can connect the things of God to this young generation? What's the best way that you, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, can connect the things of God to this young generation? As a pastor that I grew up with, was an amazing influencer in my life, Pastor Bobby J. Wilson, and he spoke these words over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know what they were? Plot on, 
plod on, plod on. Pastor would continue to sink those words into my spirit. Why? Because we, as we walk through life, man, maybe it's going to go well for a season. Maybe it's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Maybe it's going to look like you're about to nosedive and you're going off the edge. Listen, no matter what happens in life, plod on, plod on, plod on. And live your life as a faithful dedicated, committed, consistent believer in Jesus Christ. When we do that, we really will teach this young generation what it's all about. We will be Anna's. Let me pray today. God, I thank you for this amazing church. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every one God, that is hearing this word today, God, may they be encouraged to know that, yeah, maybe we're not as young as we once were, but we're far from dead. And we still have a lot to offer. We still have a lot to give. Why? Because when we live our life out of a relationship with Jesus, we're teaching lessons to this younger generation. Whether we like it or not, believe it or not, know it or not. God, I pray that you would Give us the enthusiasm, the courage, the passion to live our life well. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.
Thank you so much, Pastor Forrest. What a great word from the life of Anna. AGF, listen, we love you and we miss you, and we hope that you'll stay connected through our social media accounts during this difficult time. Be sure to like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and don't forget about our Instagram and our Twitter feeds. Thank you so much for your faithfulness through giving. Because you are biblical stewards of all that God has blessed you with, you are allowing our ministry here at AGF not only to survive, but to thrive during this difficult time. May God richly bless you as you're able to give. Just a reminder, this coming Thursday, May 7th, is the National Day of Prayer. Won't you join us in praying for a national revival, a global awakening to take place in our world, and many people would turn to Christ and God would heal our land. We can't wait to see you next week. It will be Mother's Day, and we will be honoring all of our moms. Miss Jeanette's going to be bringing the word, and she's got a great message for all of you. So until next Sunday, this is Pastor Rob saying I love you, I miss you, and I can't wait to see you next Sunday. God bless.